Hi, welcome to Canna Spader Christmas. This video is the first in a series about beginner RGB pixels. Now, pixels are the latest in lighting technology available at the time of this video. So if you want to know more about pixels, what they are, what you can do with them, how do you make them work, uh, stay tuned. I'll cover the basics of everything you need to get started and as equally important, where to go for help. And you will need help. This video is not intended to completely cover all aspects of the hobby. Um, technology changes practically every day, and being a technical hobby, many members will experiment with new devices or techniques every day. So this video will just cover the basics of an RGB lighting system. Now don't let that term scare you. It's like having a high-end stereo system where you've got a receiver and amplifier, you've got a record player or a CD player, and speakers. It's just lights and computers. I'm going to break this video up into sections and leave a table of contents in the description. So watch the whole video and then if you want to come back and review a particular section, you can easily just jump to the section you want to watch again. RGB pixels are LED lights with one red, one green, and one blue LED in a single package. So RGB stands for red, green, blue. Those three colors can be mixed to make additional colors, although some pixels do that better than others. Some of the newer pixels have a white LED in them, so they're called RGBW, but the most popular these days is RGB. Pixels are part of a lighting system. There's a few simple parts to this system, and I'll go over that in just a minute. When you go to the store and you buy a string of lights, that string is a lighting system. You plug it in and the lights come on. Now it's not very exciting, but it's very simple and it works. No, don't look at the light. I can't help it. It's so beautiful. Similar to traditional incandescent lights, pixels come in a variety of shapes, sizes, and voltages, but they all pretty much work the same. There are bullets that look like traditional Christmas lights, flat bullets where the back is flattened off, some with sealed diffusers, some with detachable diffusers, RGB pixel modules with more than one LED per node. And usually these are in strips or you will see them in square nodes. And finally, flexible strip. With the exception of strip, pixels are generally molded in epoxy to protect them from the elements. Now some strips do come with a silicone cover to provide that protection. Just make sure that it's sealed at both ends. Another good use for strip is putting it inside something like PEX tubing that you get at the hardware store. Not only does it protect it from the elements, but it diffuses the light inside the tube and makes a neat effect. There are two general types of pixels, dumb and smart. Now dumb pixels act more like a traditional string of lights. The difference is you can change the color. So if you want red, they turn all red. If you want blue, they turn all blue. Purple, same thing. Magenta, mauve, taupe, fuchsia. With smart pixels, each individual bulb or node as we call them is addressable, meaning it can have a different color or brightness than any other node on the string. So the first node can be red, the second can be green, and the third can be blue. The other cool thing about smart pixels is you can change color and brightness very quickly. This allows us to produce patterns with the lights, which makes them very exciting to use. So what makes up a pixel lighting system? Well, you need pixels. You need one or more power supplies. You need a pixel controller. And if you want to take these to their full potential, a computer. You may be thinking to yourself, well, that sounds pretty complicated. 
And if you're new to pixels, there is a bit of a learning curve, but it's not rocket science. Well, maybe it is, I don't know, but you don't have to be an expert in it. Let me break it down. Pixels need two things to work, power and data. Every light needs power of some kind, so it's really not that big of a deal. Serial data is what tells the pixel the color and brightness you want. And there's computers and software to help you do that. Pixels generally run on 12 volts or 5 volts DC. There are some that run on 24 volts, but the majority is going to be 5 or 12. Now, it doesn't really matter which ones you use. It helps if you can stick with one voltage. Uh, if you mix them, just make sure that you connect the strings up to the proper voltage. If you connect 5 volt strings to 12 volts, you'll probably burn them out pretty quickly. Houston, we have a problem. 5 volt pixels are more efficient in terms of power, whereas 12 volt pixels generally require less power injection. Really, it's personal preference. Either way, you will need one or more power supplies. The Meanwell brand of power supplies are the best in terms of construction, circuitry, and filtering, but that comes at a price. The cheaper alternatives get the job done, but I'd suggest having a spare just in case of catastrophic failure. Now I have had several of the cheaper alternatives for several years, but I do replace them with Meanwells as I can. Uh, I'll include links to both of those below in the description. So how do you know how many pixels a power supply can handle? Well, the ballpark method is to multiply 0.06 amps times the number of pixels if you have single LED nodes. Now, the general recommendation is to stay under 85% of the maximum capacity of the power supply. So if you have a 30 amp power supply, stay under 25.5 amps. That is for all white at 100% brightness because all three LEDs are pulling maximum current, which is about 20 milliamps each. So 100 pixels is 6 amps. Now I live in a residential area, so I run my brightness at 30%. Any higher than that, and I might start getting complaints because pixels are very bright. So my multiplier is one third of that or 0.02 amps. So 100 pixels is 2 amps. Now actual pixels may be different so either check with the manufacturer for the current draw specifications or just measure the current draw yourself. Alright, how do you get data that the pixels need? Well that's the job of a pixel controller. Some pixel controllers are standalone, meaning that you apply power and they start generating data. Other controllers act as converters, so you give them a signal from a computer and that converts it into data that the pixels need. Which one's better? It really depends on what you want to do. Standalone controllers are generally used for testing strings of pixels or if you just want to use them for party lights. You don't really care what the pattern is, you just want them to light up. Now, if you want to synchronize patterns over your entire display, you'll need a controller that converts data from a computer. There are a handful of manufacturers that make controllers. Uh, Falcon is the Cadillac, it's got a lot of nice features, uh, uses the latest technology. Sand devices, a little older design, less expensive, but they are great controllers too. I'll include links to both of those in the description. Uh, one thing about controllers is they are specialty items. You can't just go to your local electronics store and pick one up. You can usually order one from the manufacturer's website. Uh, end of year is probably not the best time to try and order one of those. So you have pixels, power, and a controller. Now, if you have a standalone controller, that's all you need. If you have a controller that takes input from a computer, you have a little more work to do. Now, a computer serves two purposes, programming and playing a sequence, or multiple sequences. A sequence is just data that tells the lights when to turn on and off and what color to use. Sequences are created with software. There are a few choices depending on the type of computer you have. Uh, I use a free program called Xlights. I'll include that link below. It runs on Windows, Mac, or Linux. 
Uh, now creating sequences can be time consuming, but if you just want to get the basic display set up, you can create one in a matter of minutes. Once you have a sequence, you connect your computer to your controller, play the sequence, and enjoy your lights. If you use X lights, Keith does a great job of going through the changes from all the developers that have been merged in over the past month or so and posts the video to YouTube. If you want to stay up to date on the latest changes, I highly recommend you subscribe to his channel so that you'll see those videos as he posts them. I'll include a link to his channel in the description below. At some point, you will have a question about something that you're working on. In the descriptions of all my videos, I have listed several forums and Facebook groups where you can get help. The forums are an encyclopedia of lighting knowledge, and it's a great way to meet other people interested in this hobby from all over the world. Anytime I get stuck on something, I'll first do a Google search because the chances are the question's already been answered. If I don't find the solution there, I'll post a message on one or more of the forums. It just depends on what the question is. Forums are a great place to keep up with the latest trends, news, and really just to see what other people are doing with their displays. If you know absolutely nothing about electronics, or even if you do, I highly recommend you check out the Lighting 101 manual at AusChristmasLighting.com. I'll link that below. Christmas Expo is a midsummer annual event held in the United States. It has vendors selling their latest offerings or previewing new stuff, uh, classes on many topics uh, related to lighting, and you can network with other people with this crazy obsession. Now, if you're not in the United States, there may be an event near you. Just check on the forums. I'll include a link to Christmas Expo in the description below. Now, it does move every year, so if it's far away from you this year, it may be closer next year. With any hobby, there are some basic tools that you may want to get. Now, you probably have some of these already, but if not, here's some recommendations that may help. Now, this is not an exhaustive list, nor do you have to have everything on the list. You will need some wire cutters for cutting cable. Wire strippers remove insulation from cable. Needle nose and or bull nose pliers. A tool for crimping terminals or joining wires. An assortment of screwdrivers, both Phillips and slotted. I also have some smaller versions of these for tightening wires to connectors used by the controllers. A box knife or other sharp knife, keep out of reach of children. A voltmeter or multimeter, it doesn't have to be super fancy, just something that will help you read voltages. You may need a soldering iron at some point, and again, it doesn't have to be fancy. I used these inexpensive pencils for years. Um, I now have a temperature controlled station that's a little nicer, a few more bells and whistles, but it pretty much does the same thing. A heat gun for heating heat shrink tubing. Different diameters of heat shrink tubing for sealing connections. You may want some sort of magnifier, either one that you wear on your head or one with a stand to see small parts. It gets more important the older you get. A generous supply of cable ties and you may want to get a cable tie tightener and cutter. An assortment of different colors of electrical tape. Though not required, I've been getting a lot of use out of my DeWalt DWHT GR50 glue gun lately. There are a few tricks to saving a little money in this hobby. Uh, the first is just to look for sales at your local home improvement stores and you can also participate in group buys. Now you'll usually hear about those on the forums and it's basically just a group of people pooling their money to buy a large quantity of something so everybody gets a price break. Now those usually occur early in the year or at least the first half of the year anyway. Planning your display's layout will help you decide what you need to buy or build during the year. Work on props early if possible so that you don't have to build while you're setting up. It's a goal, not a requirement. Finally, 
Buy things like wire or ethernet cable, uh, heat shrink tubing, even power supplies in bulk. You will usually get a price break for larger quantities. Now, do your own research and ask about it on the forums before committing to the purchase, but you can save some money buying in bulk. And I'm not talking about buying a shipping container's worth of stuff. For example, you will pay more buying 10 rolls of 100 feet of cable versus buying one 1,000 foot roll of the same cable. A little pro tip, and I'm sure this goes without saying, but this is just a hobby. Make absolutely sure that you feed your children, uh, your wife, yourself, your pets, uh, and, and get your wife something nice for her birthday, your wedding anniversary, uh, Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Cinco de Mayo, uh, Mother's Day, Easter, Memorial Day, Independence Day, Veterans Day, Christmas Eve, and Christmas Day before you go out and spend a bunch of money on lights. So those are the basics. Now I know it's a lot of information to take in in a single video. I will dive deeper into some of these topics in future videos. Pixels are a little more involved than buying some strings at the local hardware store and plugging them in, but they aren't super complicated. They help you make some very unique light displays. Now if you're just getting started, let me welcome you to the hobby. I look forward to chatting with you on the forums and seeing what you come up with. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again soon. And all the dogs run. Flying over. There's so many cars going back.